Metamorphosis is a word that, I don't know, maybe before today you haven't heard that since high school or something like that, uh, but it's the process of change whenever something um, is in one state, and then before you know it, it is in a totally different state. It's a change, it's a process. It is movement. Uh, the most classic example is a caterpillar who winds up in a cocoon or something like that, and then by the time that caterpillar emerges, it's not a caterpillar anymore. What is it? It's a butterfly. It has changed. It has morphed into something totally different. Scientists, I think, aren't uh, totally convinced about how that works, but uh, they do know that some old cells die and some cells that have been part of that caterpillar uh, since it was born finally come to life, and so it's a process of the old passing away and of the new coming, and it turns and it changes into something totally different from what it was. I want you to keep that in mind because in about five minutes, we're going to come back to it, and I want you to remember what metamorphosis is. It's a pretty good picture of what we talk about today. Last week, we began a series called Starting Point, and this whole idea is where I am is probably not where I should be. It's at least probably not where I want to be. Uh, there are some things probably that we would all change and do differently in our lives, and so this is a series about how to get from where I am to where I want to be, to the middle of the maze. It's four ideas about how to get on the right track and to make the right moves and not mess up my life anymore that I maybe already have. It's how to get from starting point to the point at which I want to be. Last week, it was about faith. I've got I've to put my trust in something greater than myself. It was in Jesus, and that trust last week, we said it frees us to sacrifice and to serve and to live as God wants us to live. Today, it's the idea of metamorphosis. It's a change. It's transitioning into not what I've always been, maybe not the, the mistakes that I've always made, the sins that have plagued my life. It's about getting from that into something totally different, totally better, finding the middle of the maze. Jesus had some really good insight into what that looks like and, and what we ought to do. He placed an importance on faith, and he also placed an importance on the idea, the subject that we're going to talk about today. I want to show you three strange texts this morning, uh, starting in Luke chapter 3, that kind of emphasize this. It, this one is not about Jesus. This was actually uh, John the Baptist, uh, and he's called John the Baptist because he baptizes people. And so he's out in the Jordan, and, and that's kind of where we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 3. He baptizes at the Jordan River. There's a time in the Gospels where Jesus goes out there and wants John to baptize him, and uh, John says, I'm not worried to do this. You're the one who's the, the all-important one here, and Jesus says, no, you're the baptizer. You do the baptizing. And so in Luke chapter 3, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod, being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Traconius, Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John in the wilderness and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and a forgiveness of sins. Voice of crying in the wilderness. That's a quote from um, Isaiah. And so verse 7, I want us to skip down there. Let me give you a quick background on John. He's in the wilderness because it seems like that's where John fits best. If you look at his clothing, it's camel hair, uh, which seems pretty rustic to me. If you talk about what he eats, it's locust and wild honey. There were probably better meals available during that time. John didn't care about that. He's rustic. He's in the wilderness. That's exactly where he needs to be. If you, tr uh, you know, kind of trace uh, John's existence as the one who's laying the foundation and, and preparing the way for Jesus, he does not mince any words. If it needs to be said, John says what needs to be said. He doesn't pull any punches. He's going to tell you exactly what is on his mind. And so he's baptizing out at the Jordan. And people are coming to him all day to be baptized by John. Got to get out there to the Jordan. Got to get baptized. And so these people... They have some inclination of religion, and they know something about God, enough to know that I should be baptized. I need to get out there to John for this baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And so they come out to him, verse 7. And he said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Okay, John doesn't pull any punches, doesn't mince any words. If we're talking about, uh, you know, the best church growth tactics we're probably not going to say, when you get some guests in church, you just say, you bunch of snakes. That's not how you do it. In our mind, that's not how we would typically think about how to do things, but that's what John does. By the way, in case you're trying to keep score here, snakes is not a good thing in the Bible. 
You find the first snake on page one, and it is not a good situation. It's what introduces sin into the world. And so when John says, you bunch of vipers, you snakes, he's not just saying, you all are good for nothing. He's saying, you guys are children of the devil himself. That's not a compliment. You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to, uh, from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the uh, root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Those are some pretty devastating words. We hear them say, well, we are children of Abraham. And we say, okay, well, that means you're Jewish or something like that. That's not what they meant. When they said, we have Abraham as our father, they are effectively saying, we're good. We were born into God's good graces. Just because of our lineage and our heritage and the fact that we are descended from Abraham, we don't really need to do anything. And John says, you are missing the boat. You snakes, you brood of vipers, you got to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And so they said, what do we do? Verse 11, and he said, well, if you got two tunics, you need to share with the one who doesn't have any. And you got food, you need to share with the one who doesn't have any food. Tax collectors came to him to be baptized, and you know how tax collectors are viewed? And they said, teacher, what do we do? And he said, well, don't collect any more than you are authorized to collect. Soldiers came, what do we do? And he said, don't exhort money from people by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. We're children of Abraham. We don't have to do anything. And John says, I got news for you. It's not good news. You're snakes if you think that. That's not good. That's not a compliment. You need to change what you're doing. They come to him. We want to have forgiveness of our sins. We want to, to be better. We want this repentance in our lives. And John says, you got to get to the middle of the maze somehow. Here's your starting point. I'm telling you how to make the right moves and get on the right track and not mess up your life anymore. Stop living how you've been living. Start living how God wants you to live. And John says, this is what repentance is. More on that in just a second. Okay, go to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 4. And here's another strange encounter. Matthew chapter 4. All right, a little background here. By this time, Jesus is on the scene. He has showed up in an obscure Galilean synagogue, and he has told everybody there, I'm here to preach the gospel. And the gospel is... If people are captive right now, Jesus says, I'm setting them free. If they're bound by Satan, I am releasing them from those bounds. If they are heartbroken, I'm here to, to give them a better way. Over and over and over again, I've come to, to preach this message of good news, and they know it. They know that their job is to believe the gospel and to, to put it to practice in their lives and to share the gospel with other people. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 12, John, our friend we just met in Luke chapter 3, John has been arrested because he didn't pull any punches. He calls people snakes. He points out the faults of the rulers of the land, uh, the guy who's in charge of the whole province. He said, you are in trouble if you don't change your ways. And so he's been arrested. Um, and then verse 17, this is what's really important for us. From that time, Jesus began to preach and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what's interesting here to me is that usually we talk about repentance after we've given a whole bunch of lessons. Or we've taught a lot and said, this is maybe who you are and this is what God wants you to be. And so at the end of the day, what you need is to turn from who you are and be what you need to be. But Jesus begins it. And he's got to have in his mind right here that these people, you know what to do. You've heard the gospel. You know that you're supposed to be working with the poor and, and the needy and the sick and the blind and, and the ones that everybody's overlooked. You don't need to be overlooking them. And Jesus says, you know what to do, but the problem is you're not doing it. In our maze concept, you know the right moves to make. You know the right track you need to be on. You know where the middle of that maze is, but you're still over here at your starting point, and you're not doing anything to get where you need to be. And so the call in verse 17 is to turn from that because the kingdom of heaven is here and it's time for you to get your act together and do what you know you need to do. All right, Luke chapter 13. This is the one that Lynn read for us a few minutes ago. So, uh, so we're not gonna really spend the time reading it. But what's happening in Luke chapter 13 is these people are coming to Jesus and they've got mistakes and faults and problems in their lives, but they're talking about somebody else. They're talking about what we would call those people. 
there are some people who, um, you know, were, were slaughtered because of their faith, and, and Pilate mixed their blood in the first couple of verses in Luke chapter 13. And Jesus, they're, they're talking about those people, and Jesus says, do you think those guys were worse sinners than y'all are? Surely not. And he says, what you need to do is to turn away from your sins. Don't worry about them, what happened to them. You think they're worse sinners. Are those 18 construction workers when the tower fell on them and it killed them? Jesus said, y'all are talking about these news stories. You're talking about what's going on in current events. You're talking about those people. You're talking about what they got going on and how bad they are. And I can't believe they made those choices. Jesus says, they're not any worse than you are. And so twice in those five verses, Jesus says, you need to quit worrying about those people. You need to quit worrying about things you can't change. You need to quit worrying about things that are outside of your control. Worry about yourself. You need to turn away from this. You need to change your ways and get on the right track. Not them. You need to do it. And so in Luke 3 and in Matthew 4 and in Luke chapter 13, the word that comes up over and over and over again is the word repent. Repent. What does repent even mean? It's a compound Greek word. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on Greek mostly because I can't, but it's two words, meta, noeo. Meta is the same word for metamorphosis. It means change. Noeo is the Greek word for mind or uh, thoughts, purpose, perspective, something like that. And so you put those together, and it means change your thoughts or change your mind, change your, your purpose, something like that. And that's incredibly important for our purpose today. Because when they come to John and say, we want to be baptized by you, and he says, you snakes, you need to change your thoughts and change your purpose and change your perspective. And they come to Jesus, and Jesus says, y'all know what to do. You're just not doing it. He says, you need to metanoeo. You need to change your way, your way of thinking, change your thoughts, change your mind. And they come to Jesus and say, did you hear about the 18 construction workers? What sinners those guys must have been. Jesus says, you need to quit worrying about them. You need to change your way of thinking. Quit worrying about them. You need to worry about yourself. And so we're back with these words, meta, change your thoughts and your mind. We're back to this metamorphosis idea where a caterpillar goes in and it's one way. And by the time that caterpillar comes out, he's something totally different. Some of the old has passed away. And what was planted in him from the very beginning has finally started to take root and it's growing new life. And now... He's not crawling on the ground with all his little legs. When he comes out of the cocoon, he's got wings. And he's got to learn to live a different kind of way. And he's not on the ground anymore. He learns to fly. And his life is totally changed. He's gone from a starting point. He's made the right moves. He got into the right cocoon. He spent the right amount of time there. He's on the right track, and he emerges something totally different, something that is not at all like he used to be. And when these people come to John, John says, that's what you need to do. You come to me this way, and what God wants you to do is be something that is totally different. Change who you are. And Jesus says, you come to me knowing what to do and not doing it. What you need to do is take your starting point right here and change into what God wants you to be. Those construction workers and those people who Pilate killed, yeah, they, they probably were sinners. We all are. But you need to quit worrying about them. You need to find out where you are, Jesus says, and change into who God wants you to be, all right? Repentance is a change of mind or thoughts, and the way that I think changes, and my purpose changes, and, and my mind changes, and it promotes a change in the way that I live. That's what John called these people to do. That's what Jesus calls these people to do, and I gotta tell you today, that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. And so if I can challenge you a little bit real quick, right in the middle of this, Maybe you're thinking about somebody else. Maybe you're not thinking about this at all. I don't know. But maybe if you are thinking about it, you're thinking about somebody else. And I wish they were listening to this sermon. Or those people really need to hear what he's saying right now. Can I tell you, this isn't a sermon for those people. It's not a lesson for them. It's for you. Okay? It's for me. When they come to Jesus and say, those sinners over there, how bad must they have been? Jesus said, this isn't for them. This is for you. And those people come to John and say, we're good. Everybody else probably needs the repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We're all right because we have done good things and we are good people. John says, y'all snakes, you've got to listen for yourself, not worry about them. 
Okay, so repentance means a change in mind, a change in thoughts that leads to a change of action. And that's good for us to know up here. It's not good for us to know up here if we're just thinking, I hope they change their mind. I hope they change their thoughts. I hope we can see some fruit of repentance in their lives. It's not about them. It's about me. It's about you. So I want you to think this morning about this metamorphosis idea, about repentance, about the need to change who we are, to get from our starting point to where we need to be. And I need to think, what's repent mean for me? I got four areas. The first one is thoughts. Don't think about them. Don't think about somebody else. Don't think about what they're probably thinking about right now. Don't think about your spouse, your husband, wife, your kids sitting down the row from you. You. Do you need to confront not their thoughts, but your thoughts? Are there any impure, unclean motives in your mind? In the last week or so, in the last day or so, have there been any lustful thoughts? In the last week or day or so, have there been any thoughts of envy or jealousy? Anything like that? We're thinking about thoughts right now, the way that we think. And starting point number one is I've got to think about my thoughts. I've got to confront these thoughts that I have. Before I can ever change an action or words or anything like that, I've got to think about my thoughts. So how's your thinking? How's your mind? What's your purpose in life? Is there some kind of confrontation, repentance that you need to have in your thoughts, a change from where they are right now, where they've been the last week, to where they need to be? Second, repentance for me, not my thoughts, but my words. The words that come out of my mouth, are they uplifting words? Are they words that that help people? Or do my words tend to tear people down? Do I, do I speak a lot out of jealousy or envy? Do I speak a lot of harsh, criticizing words? It's so easy to criticize somebody else. That's what you see in Luke chapter 13. Those guys must have been such sinners. Those people must have deserved it so much more than us. And Jesus says, Get your, man, you're, you're talking about them and what your words coming out or criticizing them. Change your own life. Focus on yourself. Quit worrying about them. My words, have they been used to spread Gossip. Gossip, uh, best definition I've ever heard is, is saying something I like about somebody that I really don't. Have I used my words to spread those kinds of messages about other people? The words that come out of your mouth, have they been uplifting or have they been tearing people down? Your actions are number three. Are there some present things in my life, some things that I'm doing right now, not that they're doing, not that those people are doing, but that I'm doing right now that I really need to confront and stop is there a temptation something like that a sin that i keep falling to over and over and over and again and i just i just keep doing it and it's just who i am it's just what i've done it's just the kind of person god no it's not think about your actions is there some kind of present ongoing sin that you're involved in that you need to cut out right now that's repentance going from your starting point of where you are to where god wants you to be what actions in your life do you need to confront and the fourth one and maybe the most important one what about our relationships? Our relationships. We have this relationship with one another. We're all Christians here. We are uh, in the same boat. We're trying to, to serve the same God. We're serving the same master. Is there a relationship within this room right now that needs to be repaired and restored? Is there something I've said that's offended somebody else, and I know it because I meant to offend them, and I've not sought reconciliation. I've not apologized and asked them to forgive. Today would be the time I need to do that. Is there somebody in this room right here or somebody that maybe usually is in this room who offended me and they came to me and they asked me to forgive them and they promised not to do it anymore, but I'm still harboring that unforgiveness. So I need to confront something in my relationships in that way. As a parent, am I doing a good job of leading my, my household in the way of the Lord? As a child, am I doing a good job of honoring my parents? By the way, even if you're 20, 30, 40, 60, you're still a child. And if you have parents, they're still your parents. And so am I honoring father and mother? Am I bringing my children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Am I being the kind of spouse that God wants me to be? Maybe there's a confrontation in our relationships that we need to have. It's about finding our starting point and seeing where God wants us to be, finding the middle of that maze, and finding out what I got to do to get on the right track, to make the right moves, to not mess up my life anymore. And it very well is possible that today, that's the Bible word, repent. 
And whether it's your thoughts, your words, your actions, your relationships, I don't know if you need it. You don't know if I need it. Only you can decide for yourself. Let's stop resting on who we are and what we've done. Let's stop worrying about everybody else and talking about those people and wishing that they would change because you don't have any control over that. Let's take the advice of John the baptizer and take the advice of Jesus. Let's apply it to our lives and let's worry about ourselves, my thoughts, my words, my actions, my relationships. If it's somebody in this room, if it's a, another human relationship, of course, God calls us to work towards restoration in that relationship. He actually says, when you are going to make your offering and you realize that you got a, a division between you and your brother, you leave your offering on the altar, you go make it right with that person, and then you come back and you offer your worship. We're about to gather around this Lord's table in a few minutes. Before that, you're gonna have an opportunity to make some things right in your life. If you got some problems and relationships and words, actions, and thoughts, then here's your time to make it right to get your life back where it needs to be, to, to make the right moves, to stay on the right track. If it's a relationship with somebody else in this room, let's work on that. The primary relationship we have is with God. And as we are gonna sing this invitation song in a few minutes, we invite you to think about that relationship. It's very possible that you're in this room this morning and you don't have any kind of relationship with God right now. Maybe you're here and and you want that, you desire that, but you've never really figured out how that works or what you need to do, here's your starting point. As we sing this song in a few minutes, we're gonna invite you to come and, and get your life right with God to get on the right track. And faith, repentance are part of that. Being baptized into Christ is what initiates this. That's not the end, that's the starting line. And so from that point, we grow in our relationship with God. We grow into more of the kind of people that God wants us to be. That's our starting point and it gets us on the right track to being where we need to be. And then we're gonna come around this table in a few minutes to celebrate this restoration, this, this opportunity at uh, forgiveness, this chance at heaven that God has given us. We, we come around the table uh, to remember the death of Jesus that breaks down the walls and removes the barriers between us and God. He loves us so much. He wants you so much that he gave his only son to make that happen. I can't answer for you. You can't answer for me, but we're gonna have to give an answer. If you're not sure what that answer is, and if you're not sure where you stand with God, maybe this is the time where you change that relationship. It's a private need. Spend some time in this invitation song, just you and God.